Good morning. In this episode, you could realize your dreams of becoming a game designer. What? Yes. I've got something really cool to talk to you about. So, uh, come on in and watch the show. Good morning. Welcome. It's the Weekender. That can mean only one thing. We have a ton, a ton, a ton of gaming stuff to talk about. Can I not sleep in? No. I wasn't allowed to sleep in today. No. I've been busy no. all week. No, you were so <laughs> grumpy when I called you this morning to bring you into the show. What are you calling me for at this time of the morning? Right. That wasn't the exact phrase I used. I know. It, it, it was probably a little more colourful than that. It was a little more. Family okay. Show. In this show, we're going to be talking about some... Ugh. awesomeness from Privateer Press, who are absolutely on fire at the moment. We've got some stuff from Weta Workshop I want to show you. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about Syntopia. And we're also announcing the winner of the Facebook Titan. But before all of that, mm -hmm. before all of that, I've got a competition. I've got a challenge, okay? Last week in Weekender XLBS, which is the extra long backstage or the extra long bullshit version of the show, if you want to call it. I'm going to beat uh, that. <laughs> so, and it's, a, it's the version that's, a, that's made available every week on a Sunday morning to our backstagers. Uh, but last week, we were sitting on a tank mm -hmm. in a Sherman. Sherman, Sherman, Sherman. No, no, no. You're not in a Sherman now, so you don't get I to know, do it. I completely <laughs> missed my opportunity last week to do that because it winds him up so much when I do that. But, um, in the XLBS last week, we had a lot of fun. We were talking about the new Fantasy Flight role-playing game all about the end of the world. And I was explaining um, a little bit about my strategy, my personal strategy for surviving the end of the world. And entertainment. And entertainment. It's all, it's all kind of built in, really. Yeah. So, um, and what it boils down to is that the first thing that I would do if the zombie apocalypse or something like that arose is I phone Justin. And I make him take what we have um, tentatively, dubbed. tentatively dubbed the zombie Turin test. Because we doubt that sometimes Justin would even pass the Turin test, really. You know, it's like a, yeah. we reckon really if we set him up, We reckon if we set him up a bunch, of, a bunch of other bots on a chat room, people would be hard-pressed to tell him from the bot. <laughs> so, <laughs> so hang on. Set up three bots and me in a chat room and say, right, find the one that's not a bot. Yes, yeah. So um, the zombie Turin test basically is a series of questions that I would ask Justin to try and work out if he's a zombie, because uh, any When I wake the up phone, in the morning, it does take me a while. Yeah, at any time on the phone, never mind the morning, it's sometimes difficult to tell. Anyway, the conversation elaborated on all of our strategies and stuff like that, and then I got to um, our mode of transport. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay? And do you remember what my choice of transport was? Unfortunately, yes. And it was? An ice cream van. An ice cream van, uh, correct. Actually, what was the fuel type? Because I tried to tear Warren down and you completely shot me down by going by a perfect fuel type. He LPG, was it? He converted it, it yes. to LPG. We I decided converted that we'd convert LPG. the ice cream van to LPG. So myself and Justin, and my family if they make it, um, would all be in. <laughs> no, no, no. Your family doesn't need to make it. It's you and me in yeah. the ice cream van against the zombie horde. Yes, me and Justin in the, uh, against the zombie horde. Now, my reason for an ice cream van was because... Um, supplies, you know, refrigeration. I, I, you know, I have to send Justin in to get supplies from the shopping centre, and I have some very specific dietary requirements. I'll guard the ice cream van and the food, <laughs> and we have lots of different compartments for storing it and keeping it, keeping it fresh. Mm. However, on the beast of war site, um, right. uh, within minutes of it going up, um, right. one of our members, the terrain shooter, you got to check him out on YouTube. He does some great stuff. Said, "I will willingly swap terrain." If somebody can get me the ice cream van to read to do the ice cream van and the Beast of War guys in a zombie apocalypse game. And? And I thought this was so cool. Okay. I thought this was amazing. So he has people on there linking him to various uh, places where you can get ice cream vans. Yep. However, just last night, mm -hmm. just last night, I was out uh, getting a, a bottle of Lucasade 
for for my other half. Yep, uh, she's now on survival mode. <laughs> so she's on Lucas Aid to keep her going, push her in this last few weeks before the big day and baby arrives. Mm -hmm. And I was in my local little garage. Yep. And what did I find? I found this bad boy here. How cool is that? That's creepy as all hell. It, here, no, no. This is super creepy. This is the ice cream van for the apocalypse. Right. Because it even has the apocalyptic ice cream van theme tune. Do not want? How just, horrific just, is that? Do not want? <laughs> I mean, like, you'll, no, you'll just... That is so horrific. You'll just have a bunch of zombies. Just, it's just... It's just... It's just unreal. So, uh, the wee lights and all flash on it. I, I imagine that this is the same basic template or die that they use to make an ambulance. <laughs> <laughs> Roughly. But it has little sodas and, you know, all the little ice cream cones and it has that horrendously creepy music. You know, you can mm. imagine that being in a zombie movie. So, <laughs> I have found our ice cream van of doom. Scale-wise, do we really care about scale? No. It'll work with 28 mil. It's actually, I would say, if I had a hazard to guess, I'd say it's about 148 scale. Mm. Probably dust warfare, kind of our dust uh, battlefield type mm. scale. Mm. Anyway, do you want, it, does, it does get better. I've got to show you. The, the little <laughs> bits pop out to make little overhands. The canopies. Yes, the little Do canopies. the doors open? Uh, do the doors open? Uh, yes, they do. Kind of. So there's a there's a door open. You know, yeah, you know, as <laughs> okay. as kits go, I I, I th oh, oh the back hatch opens as well, which is important for Justin. Yeah, because so, you'll be driving uh, off and I'll be trying to dive in <laughs> over the watts. I don't think that's what he meant. To be honest. So anyway, so there is the ice cream van, and it got me to thinking um, that uh, we're coming into our October coverage, which is going to be our Halloween coverage, is going to be kicking off now in the next week. Yep. Um, and I wanted to do a very simple zombie uh, apocalypse game which involved the Beast of War clan or you guys, the community, uh, in our ice cream van, okay? And I thought, do you know what we should do? A very simple rule set and stuff like that there. Okay. And have a bit of crack over Halloween playing out our demise or our... Epic um, survival. Epic survival, yeah. Uh, of the zombie apocalypse in the ice cream van. Yeah. That then, and you're wondering where this long-winded story is going, it's come to this point. That then brought to, brought to mind that there was something else that we had been planning to do. So I converged them. And this is the Game Designer Challenge. Right. Okay. So the Game Designer Challenge is a collaboration between Beasts of War and some of the top game designers. Okay? Okay. And uh, what we're doing is if you have always wanted to be a game designer and get into game design and stuff like that, we're going to give you a little bit of a chance to try and get your name out there, okay? Mm. We're not suggesting that it's going to completely change your life overnight or anything like that. It's a very, very simple, fun kind of thing that we're going to do, but you'll get a bit of exposure and you'll get a bit of networking out of this. So basically what we want you to do is if this is something that you've always wanted to do, you are going to create a very simple game for Halloween. Okay? okay. We're putting it out to game designers and to partner illustrators. Okay. Let me describe what, what happens. In this post, Justin, make sure it's in this post, is a link to a form for you to fill in where you're going to fill If you're a game designer or a want to be game designer, um, you will fill in a little bit of detail about what you're going to do to make the game fun and why we should pick you. Okay? Okay. You're then going to submit that and select the box saying, I'm, I want to be a game designer. If you are someone that wants to get into illustration and you'd like to get your stuff seen, you can tick the box saying, I'm an illustrator and upload some items of uh, examples of your work. Because mm. we're creating a two man team, we're going to get two people. And marry them together. So a beast of war marriage. It's kind of like a marriage. Who knows where this could lead? So on sometime Monday, so you have literally only got about 48 hours to do this mm. because we're really compressing it. And I'll explain why in a minute. On at some point Monday, we're going to pick our game developer, the one that we're going to give the opportunity to. Right. And that game developer is going to work with us to select his illustrator that he would like or to she with. Yeah. would like to work with. Okay, 
it's open to all ages and it's open to everyone basically okay but i want to say there's no age limit on this if you're if you're a young guy or a young girl and you want to do this put it in right you will then have with your illustrator two weeks mm -hmm. to create a halloween game if you can make it about zombies and ice cream vans you're probably in with a better chance, but uh, I'm, so not gonna, I, I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to insist on that. I'm assuming you're hoping also to be added. Me running away from the horde. Yes, um, things are. You'll want to make it. Uh, you'll want to make it funny. Most importantly, you want to make it very easy for people to play. Mm. So don't go overboard. If you go overboard, you'll never complete it within two weeks. Yeah. That's why we're setting these core constraints. We don't want this to be a project that runs on and on and on and burns two people out. It's two weeks, intense fun. The simpler the better, okay? Um, Tuesday, uh, Monday, hopefully, the, we'll have set you up in our little project management system. You and your chosen illustrator will get to meet, you know, work together from that point on. On Tuesday, we're gonna hook you both up via a Google Hangout or a Skype call mm -hmm. with Alessio Cavatori. Oh. Who's gonna provide you maybe three quarters of an hour, an hour's worth of mentoring, where he's gonna talk to you about um, uh, so, you know, some game design principles, what it's like working in the gaming industry mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So Alessio's uh, given his good self. When we do this again, we've got some other top flight game designers who have uh, expressed a, their willingness to get involved. But Alessio has very kindly come on board and is going to give you an hour, an hour, almost an hour's worth of kind of free advice from his perspective. Very now, cool. Alessio is a, an absolute perfect guy to get on this because Alessio is not only a great game designer but Alessio um, also runs a game design kind of consultancy mm -hmm. okay so um, and is always expanding that consultancy so you never know what mm -hmm. might come out of that um, now here's the thing okay we as Beasts of War will then come in on week three okay mm -hmm. all been well and we'll take what you guys have done we'll tart it up uh, get Lloyd to apply some of his time mm -hmm. to tart the whole thing up into a package and then we're going to distribute it to every Beast of War fan in the world. It'll be up to them whether they download <clears> it or not, but it will be the headline thing in our newsletter that goes out to almost 50,000 people. So, um, that is an insane prize. It's going to be cool. It's going to be, be cool. cool. Now, here's the other thing. It, whatever you design is going to be given away for free. It's also going to be effectively open source. I'm not going to get too headlong into the into the whole ideas of um, which version of open source. Basically, take it as read that once you've designed it and you've given it away for free, it no longer belongs to you. It belongs to the world. So if you're a game designer who's sitting there thinking that he's sitting on the next big Kickstarter, you probably don't want to provide that. Um, uh, so and that this is another reason for us doing this. We want you to come up with something on the fly. Test yourself, test your skills, mm -hmm. and see how you get on. When it's all over, we're going to pass the game along to Alessio as well and ask, ask Alessio to give you a little bit of feedback on what he thought mm -hmm. and how it went. So keep it simple, stupid. It has to be a simple game because these days there's so many games out there that have lots of layers of complexity <laughs> hey, <do you> want? <laughs> that, that fully occupy our time. So whenever we're looking for a Halloween game or a game for a special event, remember that's a bunch of people getting together. Mm. Um, they want to be able to start playing the game. They don't want to have to sit down and start learning the game. Yep. Okay, so there's a, there's some key challenges there. So one rules writer, one artist. If we don't get any rules writers, mm, don't know what to do. If we don't get any artists, well, we'll have to write a game without uh, without art. But I'm imagine that there'll be illustrators and and uh, people, creative people with rules, or there might be one guy able to do both. I say guy, obviously I mean guy or girl. Um, so we, we will wait and see. On Monday, we'll, we'll find out. Right, I have one question. Yes. Does this have to be an original game, or can it be a bolt onto an already existing game that people would already know how to play? No, it's going to be completely original. Yeah. Right. I, I say completely original. Do not think that you have to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. If there are great game mechanics out there that you already like, Bring them in, okay? What mm. you can't do, though, is copy and paste somebody else's game. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then add thing. bits to yeah. it. Because if you get us into trouble on this, we will hunt you down in our right. ice cream van. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, I, I just wanted that clear that way. No, I don't want it to be... I don't want any prior knowledge. 
Mm. I want people to be able to to download this and and get into it. And games don't need to be complex to be fun, mm -hmm. okay? But it's up to you as a game designer to work out uh, work out how that works. And on top of all of that, so your game will be distributed free to a lot of people. You'll be getting time with Alessio Cavatori. You will also be getting interviewed on Beasts of War, where we'll be talking to you about the approach that you and your partner took on this game design, mm -hmm. so the world knows who was responsible for their Halloween fun. Okay. Or our trouble. Yes. Or, or the trouble that we <laughs> yes. get into. It's, it's part and parcel of uh, something that Beasts of War is all about. From day one, well, pretty much day one, we've always been about um, helping companies, you know, launch and succeed and talking about new stuff. You know, mm. and we, you know we don't shy away from uh, the little guys because, believe it or not, everybody starts out as the little guy. Yep. There's none of this, or we only talk about the, the top four. From Our mantra from the very start is we, we cover the industry, and the, this industry, probably more than most industries in the world, is beautiful, and it is, it, it is tons of tons of little guys mm -hmm. who are gradually becoming bigger and better yeah. and brasher and more exciting, well, and we want to try and open doors for other little guys who, who want to maybe have never had that opportunity, have never had the, the support or the bits and pieces fall into place for them to do it. Mm -hmm. Now's your chance. And all you have to do is to be able to come up with something that, that's going to be fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, so we'll pick a winner Monday. You will help us pick your chosen illustrator um, on Monday-ish. Uh, Tuesday-ish, you're going to be talking to Alessio. You have two weeks to get it together, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, we will then apply a week of spit and polish. Um, it will then go out to the user base. You will be interviewed and talked about it, and then Alessio will have a chat with you and feed you back on the, on the game, okay? Um, and there we go. I think that's going to be awesome. That's yep. going to be cool. This is going to be a very interesting challenge. Remember the ice cream van. <laughs> I'm, my, my only concern is... With the success of last week's XLBS and week Weekender, no idea why, by the way. If we see, yeah, if we see illustrators coming in and going, hmm, I think I should draw John. How are we going to draw John? We're going to draw John like Tank Girl. Yeah. If I yeah. see that, <laughs> I'll either be incredibly impressed or I you will not see me for a few months. Well, you yeah. see, this reminds me of the first ever QCon you and me went to. Uh oh. QCon is a is a, a local small gaming local event. convention. Yes. Yeah. But uh, there was an artist up in the top floor doing anime drawings of people. Mm -hmm. So went up, got mine done, not a problem. Went up with John to get his done. The fellow made three attempts to it before looking up at John, straight faced and going, no, I'm just going to have to draw you normally. You have a weird, weird shaped head. You have a, oh, you have a, you have weird, a weird head. head. I can't draw your head. I was like, <laughs> my let me, God. Let me see. Let me see. It's like a watermelon, isn't it? it, it is it? Uh, yeah, it, it's a strange kind of dented... It's like a watermelon that's been hammered <laughs> off. And, <laughs> anyway, we're going to take a very quick break. After the break, we're going to be talking about Level 7 Invasion. If huge tank battles are your thing, or making cool gaming tables, then you definitely want to check out this week's Hobby Lab for Backstage Members, where we start to address the finer points of detailing a Second World War battlefield. In this case, we have some pretty snazzy 28mm scale telegraph poles. Heck, we even have a printout guide you can use to really speed up the whole process of building them. So, this week saw a tranche of new releases from Privateer Press, mm. who I've got to say are on yeah. fire mm -hmm. at the moment, right? It's, um, there's some interesting signals coming out of Privateer Press at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm getting from it is that they, they are going to be pushing hard on their intellectual property now for the next while mm -hmm. and really expanding the universes that they have. Mm -hmm. Because for most of us, we think of Privateer Press, you, you think War Machine. Yep. You know, War Mahords. Uh, and you know what? To be fair, that's fine. That's that's what the the bulk of their growth and stuff has been based on for, mm -hmm. for a long time. But I, I suspect now that we're going to really start thinking about Privateer Press quite differently, 
Um, you know, they've brought out uh, Level 7 Invasion. Now, a Level 7 as a game, Justin's played it a lot more than I have. Yeah. Yeah. But level seven as a game up until now has been kind of squad based, going through dark corridor type yeah, things. Well, yeah, well, the the first one, you've been kidnapped by the government and placed into an alien controlled lab. You wake up, you have to escape. Mm -hmm. What I love most about it is it's semi cooperative. Yeah. So you can either work with everybody or try and go it alone, mm -hmm. and it's brilliant. It all works off sort of a, a fear factor thing. Yeah. So the more scared you are, the more tasty you smell to the aliens and around the the map, and they'll yeah. come after you. The other thing is there's some missions where you're trying to discover a room which specifically lets you get out, mm -hmm. which uh, in one of the games I played, I was actually a little bit of a get. There was a room with a button in it, unexplored room behind me, an event which the aliens couldn't get through on the other side where the other two were running around and keeping them away from me. Yeah. So I kept pressing the button trying to find it, going, where is it, where is it, where is it, as they explored trying to discover it, at which point I noticed a door behind me. Mm -hmm. I go through the door and I go, oh, there it is, guys, it's over here. And they're on the opposite end of the map, at which point I press the button, I turn it off, and I bugger off out the map while they're left to run away from the aliens. Okay. Well, it's, um, it, it's been a series of board games, yep. and it's now had, uh, it now has another one to yeah, add to I'm the right, set. Yeah, if I'm right, I believe it's the fourth iteration of the game. Now, this is called Level 7 Invasion. I'm lifting it up here because, lo and behold, just before we went on air, it actually arrived at the studio. We were going to be talking about this anyway, um, but uh, fortunately for us, it has actually arrived. Now, let me just uh, whip it open here. Now, we uh, are we haven't got to play this just yet, but we have been watching um, a lot of the stuff online about how it's played. Mm -hmm. And m I've got to say, my first thought when I saw it was, that looks like Risk! <laughs> With mm -hmm. the, it has a big world map. This takes it up from that kind of um, individual player level mm -hmm. to a more global domination type thing. And I am really looking forward to having a look at this. Um, so this is we have a the big, map big map itself. So whoa, let me just get that. And I think that any of you board gamers out there will immediately see why I thought oh, it looks like Risk. Honestly, I looked at it and I thought, oh, Pandemic. You thought it looked like Pandemic? Yeah, yeah. It's so basically what you're playing now is you're playing basically states. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's a massive alien invasion. Mm -hmm. And you um, are basically trying to repel that alien invasion. Yep. Now, the the core way of repelling the alien invasion is there's a key kind of alien character. He's called Dr. Dr. Kronos. He's Dr. from the Kronos. first game. He was in charge of that facility. Mm -hmm. And now, unfortunately, the world needs him. Yeah. But it's not his alien race, as far as I can tell, that's doing the invading now. It's a new mm -hmm. alien race. Yeah. And you can actually get, I think they're called the Gin, his alien race, on as mercenaries to mm -hmm. actually step out onto the battlefield and start helping you now. Yeah. Now, as the box, it's full, absolutely packed full of some really, really nice components. Um, as with uh, what we've come to expect of Privateer Press at the moment, um, the, the actual quality of the components is mm. Top notch, top notch. Big bag of miniatures as well, and loads of cards and dice. Now, in terms of the gameplay, um, uh, we can't obviously talk at this stage about our um, uh, whether we've enjoyed it or not because we haven't played it yet. Um, that will be coming up in uh, an episode of the weekend or shortly. However, we can talk about our kind of... Oh, expectations yes based on how the gameplay works so from what we know of the gameplay as games go this to me feels like an all-nighter okay yeah this feels like one that you, you and your mates are going to get together just to play this yeah okay you're gonna sit down at maybe five o'clock in the evening and run right through the evening with it uh, it has it has the kind of feeling of a game of uh Battlestar Galactica. Do you know why yes. Battlestar Galactica... It had the resource management. Yeah, it, but Battlestar Galactica is an event in itself. You mm -hmm. get together, you play a game of Battlestar Galactica, mm -hmm. chances are, most likely, that's the only game you're going to play all night mm -hmm. um, because it, it just, there's so much going on, especially if you have a lot of players. This will play from three to, three to five players, mm -hmm. okay? They estimate it's going to take two to four hours. I would, based on what I've seen, estimate... It could take slightly longer than that again. Especially if it's your first time. It, the reason for that is that there's a lot of layers of depth to this as a game. Yeah. It has, I think it's three main phases. Yep. 
But of those three main phases, each one of those phases has about five different sub-phases. Yep. So you're managing mercenaries, you're managing your money, you're managing your resources, you're managing uh, technological development. You're also you're, managing the main project from Kronos, which is how you finish the game. You're trying to push Kronos on in his research yep. as well. As well as that, you have uh, lots of little dials that you want to play with, and you're managing your military industrial complex. Because and the that's, terror level of your state. Because that's what keeps everything going um, you have a, a limited amount of kind of units or, or what they would basically be like armies that you're deploying mm -hmm. and they have deployment costs so if you want to deploy them in a particular zone you might have to pay a million dollars to be able to, to deploy them there's so many different things that you have to manage and whatnot mm -hmm. and i think that is great okay mm -hmm. because not every game has to be like the the beast of war halloween game where it's it's get it up and pick it up and play quick mm. some games are worth the investment of time and energy if it's a game that you can come back to time and time again yep the replayability of this game we will have to see how mm -hmm. replayable it is mm -hmm. um uh, obviously a game with this level of effort in it you would like to think that it has a lot of replayability but again we'll not know until we've we've tried it the game premise between you and your partners is it's semi-cooperative, okay? So you're trying to work together to repel this alien invasion, mm -hmm. but it's only semi-cooperative. You know, there, there will be, there yes, will be a fair bit of antagonism. You are useful to me at the moment. Yes. Oh, wait, you're no longer useful to me. Nah. You need your allies for certain parts of the game, like yeah. Kronos' research. Yes. You need yes. your allies to help fund that research to help yeah and to help control specific things. points of the research mm -hmm. now what's interesting to me in this is that um privateer press are really pushing the boat out now on expanding their worlds mm -hmm. okay the iron kingdoms is a beautiful collage of um mm -hmm. of background now it has expanded so so mm -hmm. much there's been another release uh, that's just come out as well, Justin. You wanted to talk about it. I have the Monster Nomicon. The Monster Nomicon. I, I just love I'm going to say, it. anything with Omicon in its name, yeah. I immediately fall in love with anyway. So Yeah, basically, this is your Monster Source Manual. And here is my absolute favourite creature from the entire thing. You have to look at the style of the page. Oh, look at that. <laughs> so it's <laughs> they, kind of they, been... They've literally just taken and graffitied it. It's as if the, the designer has just left the notes sitting out and they've just went, nah, crayon, crayon. These are gremlins. Uh, and what, what are they, gremlins that then attack a warjack or something? Or? They're, they basically live in the workshops of the Iron Kingdoms. So you know the way you'd have an infestation of rats in an inn or something? Yeah. Same idea for this. They would live in the workshop and start playing about with stuff at night, you know, and just causing all kinds of hell. You know, you get your pistol race and stuff in that. It's beautiful artwork. And it's really allowing you to expand your role-playing game. Now, you've played the Iron Kingdom's role-playing game. I have um, I hear it is absolutely it's fabulous. It's fantastic, but it's yeah. quite combat-heavy. Yeah. What I do like is you can port characters from the War Machine and Hordes games. Yeah. There's a little bit of tweaking. You can just bring them straight into that role-playing game mm -hmm. without any hassle. So this is beautiful. It's adding a ton more, but there was already something huge there to work from. Yeah that and you can again with a little fudging you and your friends can actually take the character you've built in the role-playing game and have them in your games of war machine and hordes which i think is fantastic it is i've that, got to say the artwork in this is absolutely beautiful oh, it's, i'm it's just looking blowing. at the croaks i think they're absolutely fantastic <laughs> yeah. it's yeah. Uh, so um you know in terms of the role-playing game justin you know just how much of a of an ex uh, how much excitement does something like this bring to you? I know I get excited at monster manuals. Mm. I have been a long time fan of mm. monster manuals. There's two things that I love: monster manuals and the Necronomicon. I've just I've always yeah. been obsessed by it. As children, myself and Lloyd watched uh, the Evil Dead. Yep, it terrified us and inspired us in equal measure. You know, I still haven't watched that. It was fabulous. And then the whole thing was about this book, the Necronomicon. Mm. We then discovered that it was uh, through uh, reading a little bit about Lovecraft. Hang on a second. This Necronomicon uh, could be a real book. And we searched and searched and searched for it. Never actually found it. Yeah. And there was old bookshops up in Belfast that we used to visit. You expected to find the Necronomicon in a secondhand bookstore 
in Northern Ireland in Belfast. Well, we asked the How guy. How old were you? He was a creepy old guy. Right. And uh, we were in looking around. You know, just any time we saw an old bookshop, we'd have a look around. And we, we said, uh, you know, he said, what are you looking for? And I said, well, we're looking for a book called The Necronomicon. And he went, oh, yeah, I've seen it once. Seen it once. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, wow, <laughs> wow. Then in 1995, or yep. was it 94? Might have been 94, we discovered the internet, and we got our first 14K modem. Wow. And we went online, and the first thing we searched for was the Necronomicon. And we found this website that had the texts, mm. um, uh, which was all the, the strange, silly uh, Cthulhu-type yep. incant incantations and stuff yep. like that there. And we thought, oh, this is great. So anything with Omicron in it, yeah. I'm always a fan of. No. But I'm a huge fan of monster manuals, and yes. I think that they add, they add so much... To it's, the potential it's allowing of the you to add playing. so many more flavors to your role playing. Yeah. You know, so you have a set of monsters. Okay, we can role play in this sort of environment. This now expands your world. So it's yeah. more than just adding monsters. It's adding more places in the world you can go and have encounters. And the brilliant thing about the RPG, if you know how to play War Machine, you know how to play the RPG. Really? By eighty percent. Uh -huh. You know, there's a few different things, but. Overall, it's pretty much the exact same. Have you noticed that's what Privateer Press do really well is crossover? Yeah. Yes. Between their their own systems, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I remember people saying, you know, when when War Machine and Hordes were coming out, it's like you can play this on the same game. It's like what you can play your Hordes and your War Machine in the same board, and I was like, that's cool. Yeah. yeah and it was. <laughs> it, it is a very very cool thing. Mm -hmm. But what it shows to me is, you know, with the with Monster Nomicon, and especially this Level 7 Invasion, mm -hmm. is that as intellectual properties go, Privateer Press is now managing more intellectual property than Games Workshop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You also have the Bodgers range. Now, yeah. yes, they're the light, silly games, but even they have their place in the world. Yeah, yeah. but it's like, uh, I think it shows you know, an incredible level of creativity within that company. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, this especially interests me because I'm wondering, could this be the next big miniatures range to come out of Privateer Press? Could we find something going on inside the Invasion, uh, the could Level do. 7 universe? Could, you know, do. could they go down that route? Uh, because the board game is great. Mm -hmm. I'm really enjoying where the plot line is going in mm -hmm. all of this. It's now went to mass combat. Yeah between alien races, and then you have, obviously, these uh, sectorials within Earth yeah. that semi-cooperate, yeah. but not always. You know, it looks to me like there's a premise for a brilliant stand-up-and-fight war game. Yeah, I mean, e even to begin with having a light skirmish game, you know, just the internal teams, but I kind of think the board games already do that. So maybe you would need to go to that big battle phase or... Yeah, I, I think if Privateer Press turn that into a tabletop game, I think it'll be mass models. Mm. Yeah, it could even be small scale. It could it even could be, be something along the it lines of be. maybe fifteen mil or, or, or whatever, or ten mil yeah. or something. Mm. That would be cool. Mm. Well, I mean, like uh, the guys at Drop Zone Commander have already broke ground on the ten mil and shown that it can be done and it can mm. be yeah. fun. Well, there have been plenty of people doing it in small scales long before that. There was obviously Epic and oh, early yeah, on Epic. as well. You know, uh, running games at small scales is nothing new. Yeah. You know, mm. anyway. Uh, we're looking forward to trying this out. Very impressed with the quality of the components. Yep. Um, but definitely, uh, are we are we starting to see um, Privateer Press's hand? You know, are, are, are they are they basically now setting themselves up to uh, to have lots of intellectual property? Mm -hmm. They may even continue this focus on board games because I've got to say, you're very good at it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the, other than Fantasy Flight, who we know are fabulous at board games. Mm -hmm. uh, some of my kind of standout newcomers to the field, because there's other there's other great board game manufacturers out there. But as in kind of general newcomers that have come from the war gaming background, mm -hmm. Gale Force Nine are doing a great job with oh, the yeah, licenses yeah. they're picking up and creating fun logical games. Mm -hmm. And Privateer Press are now proving time and time again that they they are able to create. a top-notch board game yeah it might have a little bit a little bit more complexity than i would like in a board game because i find board games are more replayable if they are that little bit simpler mm. i keep talking about pandemic pandemic is a very playable game yeah and a game that people will come back to time and time again mm -hmm. but pandemic has an intrinsic simplicity to it yes um that i think it, it encourages that replayability it also however has that the game will beat you. It's a rare day when you beat it. Yeah. You know, 
And I think that inspires people to come back to it. Mm -hmm. You know, because I want to beat this sooner game, or later, you will not defeat me. Sooner or later, you will beat it. Mm -hmm. You get that taste of beating it, and you and won't you beat it more. again. Aye. You know, it's um, but simplicity of the game mm -hmm. is what uh, I find often it allows for replayability. Because mm -hmm. if you've played a game, even if you've enjoyed it, if it's been a lot of work, yeah, if it's felt heavy to play the game, you may find that you and your friends. Um, are less likely to get together and 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 have a go at it, but we'll have to we'll have to wait and see. I might just uh, what's what, I might, what's, I might, the, what, uh, what's the story with this one? Yes, Re replayability. It's like Risk. Yes, to an, to an extent, you that's what you were looking at. But with um with that, I see the replayability coming where you have a group of friends mm -hmm. that play it once and then go. <sighs> now we know how to play it. They'll come back next week or next mm -hmm. month and sit down and go right we now know how to play what strategy will work yeah and they'll work on their strategy and they'll mm -hmm. see how far you can take the cooperation yeah. and yeah. where you can break off i think that's where it'll lie yeah although i think the next logical step for this would be to be playing the aliens instead of the humans mm -hmm. which could be fun well do we'll wait and see yeah depends if we know enough about them okay we're going to take a very quick break after the break i'm going to talk a little bit about lord of the Rings. So, things are hotting up in the whole Hobbit and Lord of the Rings mm -hmm. sphere at the moment. One of the standout things for me this week was that Weta Workshop who are the guys basically behind a lot of the, the special effects and things like that of uh, Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. they, they, they also create merchandise for the, mm -hmm. for the, the whole... The franchise? Franchise. Yep. Good word, Justin. Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, we actually discussed this earlier. If you ever notice Warren struggling for a word and I pop in and actually add the word... That is actually something that subconsciously happens these days. Yes, it's not only him, uh, my other half, or my better half, it pops in and gives me the words that I need as well. Probably a lot more than I would like. You know? it's like yes, I will do the dishes. Yes, I will go to the shops. These, these are the dishes <laughs> like you're going Jedi to do. It's like a Jedi trick, isn't it? So she's playing on me now. But anyway, they have, uh, they have come out with what I consider probably the most stunning Balrog uh, mm. collector's piece i have ever seen guys have a look at this it is just absolutely gorgeous if you guys can yeah have a, I, a look at that there so yeah that thing is mega who did the paint job uh it comes pre-painted there's 1500 of them okay so th it comes like that so out the box i can lift that out and set it on my metal piece and go yeah i'm gonna say i painted that you could you could there's only 1500 of them okay they cost about 500 dollars okay mm. Uh, if you buy it now, it'll cost about five hundred dollars. If you wait, it's going to cost you about six hundred and fifty dollars. Yep. Mm. Okay, fifteen hundred of them. Uh, fifteen hundred of them, limited edition, twenty inches. Oh, I can see where they get the price from. Though. By seventeen and a half inches. Yeah, you can really see where they're getting that price from. By eleven inches. Yep. And uh, I've got to say, if you were looking for something, if you have a big ass war gaming room, mm. and you were looking for something to to put in that. Aye, to put in above all your miniatures. You know. That that is that is stunning. And for me, mm -hmm. that feels like a much better scale for me in the War Lord of the Rings game than the actual plastic kit of the Balrog, mm -hmm. yeah. which I always felt was a little bit small I felt a compared little to what a Balrog like a Balrog is a demonic creature. You know, it's Well when when you see the scene with Ga Gandalf, yeah. He's standing about say that tall for a twenty eight mil mini. Yep. And its head is about what three, four times yeah, the, the size. The Balrog's is. face is that. Yeah. yeah, it just it fills the screen in front of him. Yeah, it's um. So um, I I just think it it's absolutely stunning. Yeah. It's also um I hadn't actually realised just how much stuff that the Weta Workshop were actually doing, mm. and um, uh, I wonder, uh, and this is just me wondering out loud if if the Perrys are going to be maybe doing anything with Weta Workshop. I think that would be kind of cool if they did. Oh, that could be fun. Uh, because the Perrys have a long-standing relationship with uh, Peter Jackson um, mm. anyway. 
Yeah. Um, they, they've been designing custom miniatures for that guy for, for the last seven, eight years now, yeah. um, at least. Um, and now that those guys are free agents, obviously I know they're very busy doing Perry miniatures, mm -hmm. but their creativity knows no bounds for those yeah. guys. You know, it's, um, so it does make me wonder when, when I see the likes of this, you know, could they, could they end up at some point in the future doing something cool there? It also brings me to, um, I'm going to rumor mill for a little, for a little minute or two. Okay. Okay. Um, I have it on good authority that we're going to see Smaug from Games Workshop this Christmas. Well, I suppose we have the Battle of Five Armies coming out mm. in the movies, so it wouldn't surprise me if they do a kit. As to how well it's going to sell, I don't know. I reckon it's going to be about this size. No, no, because that would be Forge World. Nope. And you've already said that the Balrog that they made for Lord of the Rings felt a little dinky. I don't think Smaug is going to feel dinky whatsoever. All right, well, I, I'll take the bet on this. I'll, oh, I'll really? Bet, I'll bet that he'll be a little smaller than what you would imagine him to be. Okay. Oh, well, now, come on, now. Uh, a little smaller than you imagine him to be. All right. <laughs> a reasonable amount smaller. Right. Show me, show me on camera how small you think it's going to be. Right. I would say you'll see Smaug at about, say, that length, about your average high elf dragon size. Right. I'm, I'm going to say now, I reckon Smaug is going to be about that, yeah. that size there. Okay. About, about 24 inches. Okay. And you're, and you're saying about 11 Roughly, yeah. But, about about right. the size of a high elf dragon. Right, right. I'm going to write this down. If Schmaug's about this size, yep. you're saying it's going to be about half. So you're right. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, I, right. So what are we looking at this Christmas? Okay. This Christmas, we're looking at the final part of the trilogy yep. of The Hobbit. Okay. I think that the, the kind of the grand, the grand final piece from Workshop will be a huge Schmaug model. I also reckon it's going to be limited edition. I think it's going to be one of these while stocks last yeah. kind of guys. Okay? Maybe. It could well be resin. Okay, I'm not su suggesting that, it, that it's not resin, but it won't be Forge World. I, I think it will be a Games Workshop thing All right. um, that's, that's there as the, the kind of the big Christmas push. Mm -hmm. I could, of course, be completely wrong in all of this, mm. but I've been hearing Smaug talk now for about a year. A mm -hmm. year and a bit, actually. About this time last year, I started to hear Smaug talk, mm -hmm. um, and it's all starting to build up a little bit more now. And you know, a couple of couple of little little things have now dropped into place to make me think that this is it. This is the year of the Smaug. I I don't know because with it being that final segment, as soon as they've created that, yeah, it might be while stocks last. But as soon as that movie hits and the buzz starts to die, that entire range is just going to start to nosedive. Right. It brings me to my other topic, though. Okay. I feel... I feel really kind of... Um, disappointed. Okay. I, but disappointed in a very sympathetic way, I've got to say. I feel really disappointed that the, that the Hobbit and the whole Lord of the Rings thing hasn't been bigger this mm. time around. Mm -hmm. Okay? And... I lay, I lay a big lump of the blame of that at Games Workshop's feet, okay? Right. But before I get into that, I will, I will admit that, that as, a, as a story, The Hobbit up until this point hasn't particularly suited a, a, a kind of a tabletop game. Yep. It's been all right, you know, but it's... it hasn't particularly suited. If they'd come up with some great board games, you know, imagine Escape from Goblin Town done mm -hmm. as a, a board game mm -hmm. rather uh, than or a dungeon crawler. Yeah, yeah it, so, um, but you know, done it as a self-contained, lots and lots of plastic elements, mm -hmm. you know, a huge amount of plastic. You know, do it as your limited run type thing. Get mm -hmm. it in there. It hasn't really suited it. Lord of the Rings. Do you know what the first film, Lord of the Rings, didn't particularly suit it either? It wasn't until the second film that you started to see the big battles and mm -hmm. stuff take place. Where you know it really started to to suit that kind of uh, tabletop engagement type thing. Yeah, it felt like those grand medieval battles. Mm. However, Workshop did a much better job marketing it first time round. Mm. You know, it, Workshop obviously grew tremendously off the back of the the Lord of the Rings, mm -hmm. but they did things like partworks. You know, Games Workshop were involved in a Lord of the Rings partworks that brought it out to the masses. 
you know, they really pushed Lord of the Rings into the, the, the front of the, the windows. Mm -hmm. If you have, if you've been following White Dwarf for a long number of years, you'll know that during the whole Lord of the Rings thing that you barely got anything else on the cover of a White Dwarf other than Lord of the Rings. Um, that may be good, that may be bad, but it resulted in two things. One, a massive kind of influx of people that were interested in Lord of the Rings, Aye. massive growth for Games Workshop, but when the movie stopped, ultimately, and as we all know, it's, it's well recorded now, it resulted in a massive drop. However, in saying that, why did Workshop not do the same this time? I don't understand. You know, because it, they, they might have said, well, we only want controlled, sustained growth. Mm. But if you're sitting on a massive license that has the potential if you if you execute it properly, mm. has the potential to to go big, and you've learned from your experience that it, it'll only go big for a limited period of time, mm -hmm. surely you would do whatever it took to make it go big, but just manage the whole drop off period. You know, manage your investors and your stockholders to say we're going to we're we're going big. We're you know, and every year in your your annual report say. Well, this is expected big growth. Remember, it will contract, but mm -hmm. here's what we're doing to capitalize on this growth. But bear in mind, it will retract. Yeah, so, you know, here, so here's the butter zone. Mm -hmm. Expect to have good times here, but just as soon as we get past this point, it's just it's going to start to drop. It, it's going to drop, but we're aware of the drop. We know the drop from last time, mm -hmm. and here's what we're doing to to ensure that the drop is not painful for the company. Yeah. You know, it's uh, that the company still performs well because, you know, the, the people invest in companies more often than not based on their kind of their long term mm. trajectories mm. and you know and people expect spikes and trop, troughs and things like that mm -hmm. but it's almost it, I, I get the feeling as an outsider that it's almost like games workshop were afraid for afraid for the hobbit to be successful mm. you know it it's like they created a a brilliant set in the terms of escape from uh, goblin town yep. but what, is it just... a, where's the noise been? Where, where's the effort mm. been? Where's the publicity been? So what, has it just felt lackluster? It's, it's felt, I felt like they've really, really dropped the ball on something that could have been um, another exceptional period of uh, an exciting third intellectual property for them. Mm. I feel like they've been afraid to do it. They, they should have been part works. Mm -hmm. They should have been way out there in the mainstream with this, you know, getting people to collect The Hobbit and stuff like that. Mm. Again, maybe The Hobbit wasn't as big a franchise in terms of the in terms of its takings and and uh, the excitement that it caused in people compared to the Lord of the Rings because people had already been to Middle Earth. Mm. They'd already been there three times, multiple times, whenever yeah. you took into account well, all of the extended diversions and things. Lord of the Rings was one of those fantasy lightning strikes where suddenly people from outside the fantasy genre went to see it and went, wait, actually, I really, really like this. Wait, I can have miniatures of this? Holy yeah. hell. Wait, there's more other stuff like this? This is cool, too. I want all of this, too. Mm. But the but the Hobbit, the Hobbit would have made it an amazing kind of uh, tabletop role-play mm. type game because I think of the environments that you would have had and the, the, mm -hmm. the things you could have done. Hell, you should have hired, well, I know he worked for you, uh, David Esbury of Carnivale. You should have took him up into the design studio and said, you're good at creating tabletop kind of RPG crossovers, why not do something like that for us, for The Hobbit, and let's see if we can create a completely different style of game. Because mm -hmm. let's face it, 40k and fantasy... And Lord um, of the Rings. Yeah, well, they're the same all, they're, 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 there's, there's different rules, there's different aspects, but they're fairly similar They have the, the same style flavor of game. again. Whereas Lord of the Rings could have been much more RPG oriented mm -hmm. than, mean the Hobbit. than uh, well, The Hobbit could have been much more RPG oriented than the other two. Yeah. You know, so th there's a lot that, that I think that they could have done, but more importantly, I think that they should have been pushing that, uh, that marketing button. They should have been doing the part works. They should have been uh, doing advertising and stuff like that of this particular range mm. uh, because it's, we're now getting to the final movie. Mm -hmm. They're now going to push out Smaug, which will which will sell out. People will buy it because it'll be beautiful. I, mm -hmm. I know it will be beautiful. Um, 
but it just feels like such a wasted opportunity. You know, it feels like we're now three years in, maybe more now, four years into mm-hmm. the, the whole thing. And it could have been so much more. If And I think, it, I don't think it would ever have been as big as Lord of the Rings. Mm. But I think if they'd had the, the cojones to, I, yeah, to yeah, really yeah. open up and market it mm-hmm. and not be, a, not be concerned by growth and stuff like that of it, but we could have we could have witnessed something really really cool. Mm-hmm. But where does it go after that? You know, what's Jackson going to do? Is he going to is he going to try and take it forward by doing something based on the Samarillion? You know, other short stories. Uh, is he going to try think. and do prequels? Is he going to take it on board now and basically write stuff that Tolkien never wrote? Um, or will he move on to other pastures? I suspect he'll move on to other pastures. Now I'm wondering, will we see it. a TV <clears throat> spin-off series? Because we've seen nothing but those from big line movies. Yeah. Again, but what have, what have they got to talk about? Yeah. Anything they do now will pretty much have to be based on the... The events of the six movies. Yeah, and it's not only the events of the six movies. You know, the entire history of Middle Earth is mm. basically mapped out in the Summerillion. Mm. You know, so it'll have to be pegged and pinned to all of that. There's a, there's mm-hmm. a lot of scope there, but it hasn't been written by Tolkien. Mm-hmm. Uh, all uh, Tolkien has just written this basic framework now um, that anybody coming in will have to write on top of. Yeah. Um, Don't know. Uh, who knows? Know. Who knows? But it, it's it just it feels like a wasted opportunity. I just I would love to have seen it do yeah. more, and it's. Um, and I'm not surprised it's done what it's done, considering how little they've done. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of going to pitch in and say it might be a possible fault of the movie, yeah. of, the, of the actual Hobbit movies, because when the first one was on its way, everyone was like, wow, the Hobbit's on its way. Mm-hmm. The movie hit and everyone went, eh. I loved it. I loved it more it than was... any of the Lord of the Rings movies that I watched. It was lighter. Oh, it was more no, 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 no. Oh, yes. No, 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 no. Take, take that opinion and take it out that door. <laughs> no, it was... Because when you, when you watch what, how the internet reacted to The Hobbit, yeah. they basically went, so it was five people running around Switzerland for two and a half hours? Because well, that's all that happened in The Hobbit. Well, that, it, that not much different happened in the first Lord of the Rings. But The but Hobbit it, was more entertaining with at it. At least the first Lord of the Rings was setting up stuff. The first Hobbit movie felt like, oh, we're walking towards a mountain. Oh, wait, that's like Lord of the Rings. Oh, wait, there's even less happening in this. Oh, I disagree. I disagree. I thought, it was, I thought it was entertaining. I, I thought it was engaging. I thought it was funny. I thought as a piece of entertainment goes, um, it was actually better than any of the three movies that had preceded it. And I think they took the humour too far. But then... Well, I've not <laughs> that, read the books. That, that I know is, they're more. The question: Will we see it become darker and grittier in this final part? Oh, well, this final part now is is almost certainly going to be grittier. But you know, you're dealing with a bunch of dwarves, guys. You know, it's uh, there, there's going to be there's the, the the whole dwarven makeup within that universe is that there's a fair amount of humor mm. within the dwarves. It's a very dry humor a lot of the time, mm. um, but there is there's going to be more humor there like, like Gimli as a character in the original movies was quite humorous in a very dry way yeah there's one scene in particular I remember where he's drinking with Legolas getting hammered and basically gets so drunk he falls off the seat yes yes but it's a uh, but the, the, whenever you've got a collection of them you've got to expect that that, that level of humor is going to ramp up I've got to say I thought that the the dancing scene where they were kicking plates and stuff like that yeah. was a little bit much for me um, I could have done without that particular scene, but I thought the rest of it was actually was actually pretty spot on. But to get on with the point I was attempting to make before you, right, hopped in, the hype for Hob- for the first one was great. Yes, brilliant hype. I have a lot of friends that were following it and mm. brilliant. But since the second movie was building up and hit, I haven't ha- heard a peep out of any of my friends that were into it. Yeah, they've went, oh, I went to see that, and I went, how oh, was it? And they went. Well, we'll I don't think it had the same impact as the first three. We've got one more opportunity now Mm -hmm. with this last movie, Mm -hmm. but this is now a very limited window of opportunity because there are no more. Um, And that that is where I completely agree with you. The second movie of the Lord of the Rings series set up the potential for big battles. Mm -hmm. It set up the potential for Workshop's range to grow and to to sell Mm -hmm. multiples and stuff like that. The second movie of uh, the hobbit didn't do that mm-hmm. it still it stayed very small scale in those terms mm. 
the Battle of the Five Armies, that's where it scales up, but there's nothing after it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's nothing there to continue it. So perhaps for all my whining, maybe, maybe they knew all along that this was going to be a tricky license for them to do anything with mm -hmm. it. And maybe it was a case that they just didn't want anybody else to have the opportunity to do anything else yep. with it. Maybe. So we, we'll have to see. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. After the break, I want to talk about a couple of Kickstarters. Kingdom Death are no strangers to controversy and this week we've seen some great debates on their latest round of releases. So if you have something to say or just want to see what all the commotion is about be sure to hop on over to beastofwar.com and find out for yourself what kind of miniature has baby slippers. So Kickstarter, mm -hmm. before we get into the Kickstarters, um, for any of you guys that backed Warzone mm -hmm. on the Kickstarter, there's now in general release, you can get it everywhere. They have just announced the Icarus jet uh, for Warzone, which i got to say looks fabulous. Mm -hmm. What a cracking looking mini. Um, so if you're into your Warzone, and it is a very, very good game, um, definitely go and check that out. We've got a post up about it on the website. Obviously, the pictures come up for you to have a look at it. But if Warzone is your thing, or if... Uh, if flyers is your thing, you're going to have to go and check that. I just kind of, I just love the whole VTOL nature of it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's just really, really cool. Anyway, um, as Kickstarters go, there's uh, Syntopia is coming to Kickstarter shortly. Mm -hmm. We have an exclusive preview about the game up on the website. So um, click the link below. Yep. I assume you're wanting the hot link on screen right now. Hot link on screen. Take them directly okay, okay. To, the, to the post. It's kind of like a dungeon crawler meets cyberpunk, yeah. mm -hmm. which I think is very, very cool. It's uh, cooperative with your friends. There's an AI deck mm -hmm. that manages the non-player characters. And you can also have a game's master if you're playing enough people. Which, is, which uh, in my opinion, as so much as I'm a big fan of AI decks, I think if you have a good GM, they yep. can, it, that really brings the game to life. Yep. Yep. So it's... Um, um, it, it has this kind of a dynamic level of difficulty, though, so that the more players you have, the more difficult it yep. gets. Uh, another game I know that kind of does that is Myth uh, mm -hmm. from the guys at Megacon Games, where it has this, the darkness. Yes. And the more players that are in it, the more kind of reactive and aggressive the darkness is. It's mm -hmm. a very cool uh, AI mechanic that we're starting to see now in more board games. So it's... Um, it's got this kind of fast-paced combat system in it. Yeah. Um, but one of the interesting things is that, it, although it's kind of cyberpunk, it has it's kind of based loosely around the fantasy tropes. Yeah, so you'll, you'll have your rogue, you'll have your knight, and I assume if you're bringing something like a mage into this world, it's not going to be a mage, it's going to be a hacker or something, I would say. Yeah. Techno-sorcerer. And all, oh, those techno -sorcery. All, all those characters... Uh, as you progress through your missions, you mm -hmm. can improve them with more kit and stuff like yeah. that. Now, one of the key selling points for me is that there's going to be 40 game poured pieces in it. So uh, that's out, going to let you go for insane maps. You lay yeah. out your own map. You know, it's got a real syndicate kind of a feel. But then any of those kind of Cybertronic, Cyberpunk type mm -hmm. games is always going to f hark back to things like Syndicate and stuff like mm -hmm. that. But it's... Um, I do love the fact that you know it's uh, it, it is that cross between a dungeon crawler and and something more punky, you know. Yeah. It's, um, and doing one of my favorite aspects of dungeon crawlers, and I think that Warhammer Quest nailed it, and I'm hoping that uh, Dungeon Saga from uh, Mantic mm -hmm. nail it as well. Is for me the part of the joy is the exploration of the game board. Mm -hmm. And the game board laying out in front of you as you go, or yeah. laying it out uh, in advance. There's um, a campaign pack or a campaign book cam uh, planned for it as well, cool. which is good because if it is a good game, it's one that you and your mates will want to play again and again. Mm -hmm. And nobody likes starting from scratch in these things. Mm -hmm. You know, a campaign yeah. is a great thing. I suggest you know, the way I approach these kinds of things, with Lloyd and my family is. We'll, we'll, we'll sit down and we'll play it first, not even worrying about campaigns or things. We'll spec up our characters, we'll play it through. And if we enjoy it, then 
we look at the campaign settings mm -hmm. the next time and we start to we start to evolve the characters and things like that anyway yeah. but you know most campaigns let's be honest you know uh, unless they come up with some really interesting campaigns most of it's record keeping yep. mm -hmm. and the bits and pieces that you can do between uh, between missions anyways due out in the next few weeks um and again if you're if you're interested in finding out more we have an exclusive preview over on beast of war where there's some great pictures of the board um, yeah, the characters and the characters and the, the potential miniatures and things as well mm -hmm. um other than that we also have slaughter ball which is uh, which is in its final days yep. now slaughter ball is a kind of like an 80s kind of um ball game you know it's, it's an 80s action-packed sports game with yep. tons of killing in it yeah um if you're interested in that kind of thing you know definitely definitely go and check it out okay do the miniatures themselves actually show off that that old school 80s style of miniature sculpting yes you know so you'll have giant shoulder pads yes you know, big buff dudes tiny heads uh yeah it, it's uh, like ben ben has fired me some notes across uh, across on it uh, you know it's a competitive board game it's ferocious Two to four teams of genetically engineered super athletes. Oh, <laughs> you know it's so eighties. You got to say, you know, they're clashing in a um, in a steel pit. Um, you score points by making goals and injuring opponents. Um, the Ben has been looking into the rules, and he says that they're elegant but brutal. You know, there there is. Mm. It's not called slaughter ball for for. So you're you're rewarded for, no for being extra violent in this game. Yeah. Um, it, now Ben had said to the, in his trials of it, he found it very quick to pick up, um, but it has a lot of strategic depth to it, mm. um, for just to to give you that replayability mm -hmm. of of brutality. You know, if you're interested in games like Rollerball, mm -hmm. you know, it's um, or Speedball, which of course we have uh, Dreadball and whatnot. Mm -hmm. This game here is is very much of that trope. You know, it, it is pure destruction. Mm -hmm. on the sports pitch now if you want to try it out there is existing print and play options oh. okay and how to play videos online and uh, like i said if you're if you're into your 80s sports games mm -hmm. with killing i go and check it out because the the minis the minis are very very cool so um that is one for for trying out mm. okay um to close the show We've got a winner to an eye. Yes. One lucky get out there is getting a Warhound Titan. Yes, this is the second lucky get in as, as many weeks. Yeah. <laughs> so we were running we were running the Facebook 40k uh, challenge. We we basically had the 40k challenge a few years back. Um when we reached 40k on the social networks, we had a prize to give away. Mm -hmm. Um uh YouTube got there first. Mm -hmm. Yep, okay. that was the Reaver. And uh, the the Reaver was given away. Um, Facebook has since got there and overtaken YouTube. Really? <laughs> yeah. So Facebook has now blasted past YouTube. Um, and one lucky uh, liker of the Facebook page was going to win themselves a Warhound Titan. And that lucky winner was Keith Nolan. Congratulations. So well done, Keith. Um, uh, get in touch. Claim your Titan. And uh, we, will, we will get Forge World to deliver it straight to you. So... Um, that about ends it, guys. This week in XLBS, we're going to be talking about tanks. Again? We'll be making progress towards uh, tank war. Okay, so <laughs> tanks. Yeah, yeah, put my ice cream van back there. <laughs> that's now. not a tank. That's, it, that's the Nacht Wolf that, command vehicle. That's right? Nacht Wolf of command, war vehicle. command vehicle. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about tanks. I also, uh, while I was on the topic of Kickstarters, Want to put a, a quick shout out about Carnivale. I'm going to be talking about it more in backstage, but Carnivale um, have uh, now secured that stretch goal for the, yeah. the miniature uh, one of a Beast of War um, member who community won member. The ability to design one. Won the ability to go in and design yeah, it. I've now seen a color drawing of that image. It looks great. It's wow. a, it's a guy with a uh, with his uh, little puppet that goes yes, off and, and kills and the things. little marionette's just carrying a rather big knife. Well, big for a marionette. I've also just seen gondolas. Gondolas. Yep, oh. gondolas. So the gondolas are on the way for that Kickstarter. Okay. I know loads of people have been looking for gondolas. Mm. Um, but most exciting for me was they've just introduced Nosferatu. Yes, the Strigoi. The undead. So you know, uh, there's a fantastic Nosferatu. Miniature uh, mm -hmm. with a with a weeping nun. 
Yeah, so, okay. So. Not going to ask for that. Go on. It's some very creepy stuff. Yep. If you got the this weekend's um, newsletter, the easing, mm -hmm. um, um, I was going to talk about this in backstage, but I'll, I'll talk about it here. I, I actually um, asked the guys at Vesperon Games to try an experiment with this, okay? Mm -hmm. I got them to create a Carnivali catalog, okay? I yeah. said to them, look, we want to do an experiment in the e-zine because in magazines and stuff like that, you'll often find an insert of a catalog, okay? Mm. I don't know about you guys, but I kind of miss browsing through catalogs. Mm. Uh, we were doing a lot of research on magazines and stuff like that there, and a couple of catalogs fell, uh, fell out, and I was finding myself browsing the catalog, and I thought to myself, you know Ooh, what I used to that? buy? Ooh, want that? Want that? Yeah, I, I remember I used to buy the Games Workshop catalog. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I used to go in, buy it specifically, just so as I could sit and just look at all the pretty minis in it. Mm. And uh, so what we did is we thought, you know, I wonder if a catalog is something that's of interest to people anymore. Something that it's a, a PDF that you could browse on your tablet or you could print it out and just sit back and just mm. look at it or look at it on your screen. So um, I got in contact with the guys at, at Vesperon Games and I said, look, We'd like to try an experiment. Would you guys like to try it with us? Could you, in a short amount of time, create a really cool catalog mm -hmm. of just the miniatures? You know, just put the minis in and the product code in it, and then people can go to their local stores or whatever and, and mm -hmm. find it. But could you create a catalog mm -hmm. of the range of Carnivale so that we can sit back and, at a glance, have a look at what Carnival is so all just, about. Just have that little shiny syndrome moment of going, oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. So um, if you've been, if you've got the easing and you're interested in giving us some feedback, let us know if the catalog thing was was kind of interesting, okay. you know, because if it is, it's something that we could work with uh, some more game mm -hmm. guys about it and say, look, you know, the catalog is actually a pretty cool thing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if you hated it, let us know, and we can say to them, don't do catalogs. <laughs> catalogs personally i've got to say i i from browsing around it mm. i liked it mm -hmm. i thought it was quite nice to have everything all in the one place mm -hmm. that i was able to flick through it and get a vibe for what was available in it in a particular game cool and uh, if you guys like it i'd like to see more companies do it yeah um and we'll, we'll reach out to them work with them get them to put together catalogs and every now and again we'll drop one in an easy and you can download it and have a flick through it and cool. see if you get the, a, a vibe for a game Okay, so XLBS, we're going to be talking about Space Hulk. It's out. There might be issues with it. Oh, dear. Okay. Uh, we're going to be talking about Workshop Search for a CEO. We're going to be talking about Tank Week. John's going to be talking about tanks. I'm going to be talking about this year. Oh, right. I probably I, I shouldn't have went like I thought you had the <laughs> uh -oh, uh oh uh oh Falling, falling. Oh, it's I'm going to be I talking about that. I thought that has been put there by mistake. John is in charge of the tanks. I've been in charge of the battlefield. Mm -hmm. We're getting together in XLBS where we're going to talk about what we've been doing. And then we've got some other things that we're going to be talking about uh, for Beast of War clans getting together for some video games. Cool. Um, it's It started off in the, the backstage forum. Um, we're going to talk to the backstagers about that, see if it's a cool idea, because there is a 40k MMO that we may well be able to... Oh, the Eternal Crusade is yeah, coming? We may well be able to get in on that with a, with a number of uh, backstagers mm -hmm. to say, let's create a clan mm -hmm. and see where that goes. And then finally, next week, we hope to be kicking off the 2014 Annual Survey and Awards. This is our end of year awards ceremony. We had to skip a year there. Mm -hmm. um, where we're going to be talking about the, the best of the business from 2014. Mm -hmm. It's connected to a survey where we're going to get all, all of the, oh, hopefully the Beast of War and the Wargaming community to feed into that survey. And then as part of the awards week, which we're hoping to do, we'll also be talking about the results of that survey and painting a picture for you guys of just what the Wargaming world looked like in 2014. Very, very cool idea. Yeah. So guys... That about wraps it up for The Weekender. If there's anything I've forgotten about, let me know and we'll cover it next week. <laughs> Other than that, please, please, why not come on across to uh, Beast of War, join backstage, get access to hundreds of hobby videos, and get access to the most awesome Weekender XLBS, which is like The Weekender. But what a lot of extra BS. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It's cool. If you like this, you'll love XLBS. Um, that's about it. We will see you backstagers tomorrow morning, Sunday bright and early. So until next week, happy gaming.